and welcome everyone to introduce Vaden, especially if you've never heard of it before. Uh, Vaden is a company that was founded in the year 2000. And from its very beginning, it's been strong in combining two different worlds of application development. There's the solid world of enterprise application development with Java. And there's the more turbulent world of development for the web. And today, Vaden does this with a collection of 45 components that it's built on the latest web component specifications. And it also builds two Java-friendly frameworks that make it easy for Java developers to create modern interactive applications. And the two frameworks are, of course, Hilla and Vaden Flow. Uh, Hilla is the most uh, modern or the most recent one from, uh, from, from Vaden. And it's one that allows uh, more reactive development styles uh, where you're developing more inside the browser and you're using languages like JavaScript and TypeScript. And uh, Hilla makes it possible to integrate with uh, Java that's running on uh, servers and providing you uh, data and services and makes it possible to do this in a type safe manner. Uh, very exciting. And then of course we have the more classic bot and flow. And as you're participating in our uh, webinar today on uh, speeding up your uh, upgrades from Vaden 8, then you're certainly going to be interested in Vaden Flow uh, because that is the, uh, the the framework that corresponds more closely to the programming style and the whole functioning of Vaden 8. We'll be looking at five different things today uh, in in our in our webinar. So um, here's the uh, sort of the plan uh, for the next half hour. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the different targets. So at this moment, there are a number of Vaden versions that you could possibly be thinking about uh, migrating to. And uh, I'll just say a few words about uh, how it makes sense to target some of these. Then we'll look at uh, the portfolio. Uh, so Vaden's uh, collection of products and tools that it has uh, that can help uh, reduce the cost and uh, just speed up your upgrade project. And then we'll zoom in on two of these specifically. We'll look at uh, classic components, and then we'll look at something uh, that's even newer uh, in our, our portfolio, that's uh, automated transformation. And that will be done by uh, Daniele. And then we'll close with uh, a few words about our assessments. OK, so um, right, uh, upgrading from Vaden 8. So uh, at this moment, there are actually five different versions of Vaden uh, that are supported. And you can get uh, support uh, for these without having an extended maintenance contract. That's Vaden 10, Vaden 14, Vaden 22, 23, and 24. It's very unusual, I think, in uh, our history that we have uh, so many major versions uh, that are, are being supported in this manner. Um, I would say Vaden 10 and Vaden 14 are not things that you should consider, but I will explain a bit more about that in a few moments. The most recent version of Vaden to be released is Vaden 24. That was actually released yesterday. In case you missed that, we have a new version of Vaden out there. Uh, Vaden 24 is uh, the, the, the latest version. It comes after version 23, which has been with us for a year. Uh, we've had a number of miners there. I would say, if at all possible, definitely go to Vaden 24. That makes a lot of sense. The only reason why you might not go for Vaden 24 is if you aren't ready for some of the uh, technologies that Vaden 24 is uh, incorporating. It requires at least Java 17 and uh, Servlet 6. And if you're on Spring Boot, um, and you don't have to be on Spring Boot, but if you are on Spring Boot, then you need to be on Spring Boot version 3. So if you, for example, are using OSGI or portlets and you want to keep using OSGI or portlets, then you would not be ready for Vaden 24 and you should be uh, targeting Vaden 23 because portlets and OSGI, uh, they're using servlet 6 and they're, they're simply not ready for, uh, for uh, Vaden 24 yet. 
Vardin 23 uh, is definitely the choice uh, otherwise. So that's certainly a stable version. So this has been uh, a year now that this has been out and it will be continued to be supported for uh, another year, uh, free support that you will have for that. And then it will follow the, uh, the regular extended maintenance uh, uh, protocols that we have uh, as, as we publish on our website. There is also Vaden 22. Vaden 22 is an exceptional version of Vaden uh, that we've uh, supported a bit longer than we uh, normally uh, support um, these Vaden frameworks. And that's because um, a number of companies out there do still depend on Java 8 and they're not able to move away from Java 8 yet. If you're in that position and you absolutely can't uh, move away from Java 8 and it's going to take a while, then Vaden 22 is would be your your best choice. Uh, you um, <clears throat> have access to um, uh, support of that. There's free support available for Prime customers. Uh, you don't need a uh, an extended maintenance uh, on that yet. Um, so that's uh, going to be for another year. Vaden 14 and Vaden 10, they are actually still supported as well. Not long left for Vaden 10, is about three months left. So certainly I wouldn't recommend uh, thinking about Vaden 10. Vaden 14 is uh, a candidate, but I really can't think of a good reason for going to Vaden 14. Um, I would say, uh, well, a lot of conversations that I have with customers, sometimes uh, customers have the impression that, okay, we're on Vaden 8 now. So it should be easier to migrate to Vaden 10 than it is to migrate to Vaden 24 because that's so far uh, away. The number 10 is closer to the number eight. Uh, and uh, that, that really isn't the case. So it's not the case that you're going to have an easier upgrade or a faster upgrade if you only target Vaden 10 or Vaden 14. Actually, the opposite is actually true. Um, the uh, the Vaden flow framework, uh, since Vaden 10, we've continued to add new features uh, to the platform uh, that uh, actually provide a number of features that you still had in uh, Vaden 8 and that were absent in Vaden 10, uh, and that's only continued. So even Vaden 24, uh, we have a number of new uh, additions in Vaden 24 that even that ma makes it easier to migrate from uh, Vaden 8. So definitely, uh, Take the highest number possible, I would say, would, would be the best advice. And uh, as certainly Vaden 24 is going to be the easiest path for you if you're coming from Vaden 8. All right, uh, that's uh, about um, choosing a target version. I said a few words about that. Let's look at our portfolio. So there are a number of tools that Vaden provides that can help you, uh, well, do, do two things. First of all, to help your project uh, go faster and, and to make it better, and also to help you build better products, to build uh, more modern products. And we'll look at uh, both of these. So uh, there's really three pillars. So helping your modernization project, there's really three pillars of tools and solutions that we provide. Um, these break down into assess, coexist, and transform. So with assess, what we're doing is uh, migration assessments and also our green light service, uh, where we're taking applications and we're uh, seeing what is the impact of migrating this specific application from uh, Vaden 8 to Vaden 23 or 24, uh, depending on what makes sense to you. So when you're upgrading your Vaden 8 application, you're essentially ripping Vaden 8 away from your application. These are going to leave some holes in your application. With the assessment, what we're doing is we're seeing how many holes are there, uh, what do we need to fill these holes, and uh, what is the effort going to be of filling those holes? And uh, that's, that's really what the uh, assessment is, is all about in a nutshell. And certainly, uh, this ties in with uh, some of the other tools that we'll uh, be talking about today. And Daniele will say a few words about this uh, towards the end. The next one is coexistence. So coexistence is something uh, that is, is available and actually has been available since uh, Vaden 10 was released. With coexistence, what we're doing is it's really something that's primarily aimed at management. And management is concerned about uh, managing risks for very long projects. Uh, we know that sometimes uh, our, our customers have very large applications, so uh, the 
effort to uh, upgrade the entire application from Vaadin 8 to Vaadin Flow, uh, this, this can sometimes take multiple months. So with the coexistence uh, solution that we have, it's called MPR, or multi-platform runtime. Uh, what we're doing there essentially is it making it possible to put pieces of uh, your application into production that are on uh, the latest versions and have them working together with the Vaadin 8 uh, versions at, at the same time. It was, it was a, a true coexistence <clears throat> solution. This isn't necessarily helping your uh, transformation happen any faster. It isn't speeding up your project, but it is helping to reduce risk, especially um, you know, in these times when there is a significant amount of uncertainty around uh, the GL political situation. There's also concern about the macroeconomic situation and everybody's talking about recessions. And there's also uh, uh, climate things that uh, people are uncertain about. Uh, so certainly committing or making a long-term commitment to dedicate resources or developer resources inside your organization uh, to not be supporting the, 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 the users with their Vaadin 8 application, but to be diverting these resources to uh, an upgrade project. Uh, this is something that uh, management might be worried about and something like MPR uh, would help them with that. But that is the topic of another uh, presentation. Uh, today, we're focusing on transformation and uh, the tools that we have to speed up the transformation and to reduce the effort uh, where we're trying to bite through the bullet and get through that uh, as quickly as possible. The two ones that we'll talk about, as I already said, is classic components and the Vaadin 8 upgrade automation. And uh, of course, there is uh, the well. There exists the tools that will help your project, but there's also the tools that will help you build better products and to further modernize your application. And these are things. Uh, there's quite a number of tools and toolkits uh, that are available in uh, for for Flow. So the late, very latest version of uh, Vaadin and Flow. Uh, there's these acceleration kits uh, like uh, collaboration kit and observability kit. And uh, these things are going to help you certainly to deploy your application, to deploy your Vaadin application in a way that might be more recognizable to uh, other people inside your organization. We're looking to uh, follow best practices for cloud deployment. And uh, these are things like um, uh, the horizontal uh, elastic um, scalability that you might be looking for, high availability and uh, rollouts that aren't disrupting users. Um, all of these kits can uh, help you with, uh, with these things. And additionally, you've got things like uh, the map components and uh, accessibility standards that have been, been built into uh, the latest versions of Vaadin that would be available to you and all these things together. Uh, gives you many opportunities to build better products. All right, we'll focus now on the classic components. So first of all, what are classic components? Classic components, These are. this is an idea that's about one year old. Uh, we launched this in yeah, March of, of last year, really. And uh, the idea with classic components is to release a number of components on Vaadin Flow that have the similar API or same API and same behavior as components inside Vaadin 8. And there are a number of components in uh, Vaadin 8, obviously. Well, if you look at Vaadin 8, there's over a 1,000 classes inside Vaadin 8. Um, but with classic components, we're focusing on a small number of these. Uh, we're focusing on these seven. These are seven components that uh, do not exist, that either don't exist in uh, Vaadin Flow, or they do exist in Vaadin Flow, uh, but simply with a different uh, behavior or an API. And uh, we've looked at those that are, well, obviously the ones that have a different API or different behavior. Uh, those components that we've seen in the community have been used the most. So that's including um, form layout, horizontal layout, a vertical layout, definitely. Uh, these are the ones that we very often come across in uh, migration assessments. And uh, some of the ones that simply aren't present yet in a flow include absolute layout and grid layout. So uh, a thousand classes in Vaadin 8, and we've chosen these 
seven. Uh, let's see what does that actually mean. So if we take a look at Vaden 8, if we take a look at one of these classes that you uh, certainly have been used to uh, uh, dealing with if, if you're a developer, uh, one of these is horizontal layout. And if you look at the Java docs of uh, Vaden 8, you'll see that there is a whole inheritance, there is a very deep inheritance hierarchy behind the horizontal layout component. Uh, horizontal layout component, it extends abstract ordered layout and abstract ordered layout extends abstract layout abstract layout extends abstract component container and it goes on so there's a, a very long list of abstract classes there if we look at the situation of vaden 24 or, um, then we see it's a very different situation it, it, it entirely it is a very flat uh, inheritance hierarchy so uh, horizontal layout exists but it only extends one single class. It's the uh, component class. So that certainly makes it very easy uh, to understand the component hierarchy, uh, whereas, yeah, it might have taken a bit longer in, in Vaden 8 to understand that, but certainly there was some uh, certain power uh, behind it. How does classic components actually help us? Well, this is going to help to illustrate uh, how uh, classic components works and, and how it can benefit your project. Well, classic components, well, literally what I said in the previous slide, they are Vaden flow components, but components that have been extended with the API and behavior of the Vaden 8 counterparts. So we see that for the, in classic components, the horizontal layout, it has the same deep hierarchy of the Vaden 8 version, but at its basis, it is a Vaden flow component uh, just like the horizontal layout is, uh, the regular horizontal layout is in Vaden flow. Now, the um, the consequences of this is that this can be this is a very dynamic situation and it's a very fluid situation, especially for your modernization, uh, because since the uh, Vaden twenty four, uh, oh, excuse me, since classic components are Vaden twenty four components, uh, they can coexist. So you could have a Vaden 24 horizontal component and inside that have a classic component or you could have a classic component and inside that classic component you could have a Vaden 24 component uh, or you could have a, a Vaden 24 component and a classic component inside a classic component so any combination is actually possible there's uh, no limitation there um, so uh, that is uh, more so you can see yes there's seven uh, components in the classic components library, but there's also been a lot of uh, attention paid to reproducing these uh, inheritance hierarchies. So there's a lot, there's many more classes involved in classic components than simply the seven components. And it goes on when you start looking at the methods. So I said uh, that classic components were, uh, you know, implementing the APIs. Uh, it really does implement the APIs and the same APIs that you found in Vaden 8. What I'm showing here on this slide is a number of, well, this is also taken from our Java docs, uh, is a number of methods that are appearing in the horizontal layout component in Vaden 8. And you can see just by looking at this, uh, we have things like remove layout uh, listener and uh, layout events that layout uh, click listener. We've got uh, set default component alignment, and then this method is taking an alignment uh, as a parameter. And then we have set margin, and this method is taking a margin info as a parameter. So layout click listener, alignment, and margin info. These are three classes that the Vaden 8 horizontal layout was using but none of these three classes is actually in Vaden 24. So Vaden classic components, classic components reintroduce not just the classes and the inheritance hierarchy of these seven components, but also of any class that was being used together with these components in any of the methods. So classic components is actually a very large library much larger than you might think if you're only uh, uh, taking into consideration that there's seven of them in, uh, in, in, the, in the package. But there's actually over 80 
classes uh, and interfaces in the classic component package. All of these are working together uh, to help give you a good backwards compatibility with the components in uh, Vaadin 8. All right. Uh, that is from the API perspective. That's from looking at it from the Java perspective. Let's look at a very simple sample of uh, using a horizontal layout in Vaadin 8. Here is uh, just a simple definition of a horizontal layout. And what we're doing is we're adding four buttons to the uh, horizontal layout. We're going to set spacings at margin. And then we uh, run this, and we're going to get something like this in Vaadin 8. Here's our four buttons aligned horizontally. And if we inspect this and if we look at what the DOM is including, we see that we've got the nice Vaadin 8 divs, div, 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 div format. And uh, that is exactly what uh, we would expect. Now, if we did the same thing in Vaadin 24, we would see something very different. So this Hello World sample, where we have four buttons arranged in a horizontal layout, in Vaadin 24, the DOM structure is very, very different. We don't have divs, divs, divs. Instead, we have these custom elements, custom elements that are enabled uh, through the web component specification. So we, we actually have this added semantics. We have something that says something and that also corresponds to the tree that we would have in uh, Java. So we have our Vaadin horizontal layout uh, and, and we don't have divs. Uh, but notice, however, that this yeah th this is a, this is very nice and this looks like it's easy to maintain, but it is very different from what we had in Vaadin 8. Uh, we're missing the slots. We're missing these empty spaces that we had between all of the different uh, uh, components that were in our horizontal layout. And we're missing missing all of these classes. We're missing the notion of primary style name. Uh, and all these other things. So if you have CSS that's depending on any of these, uh, that's not going to work. So you're, you're going to be missing that. Classic Components brings that back. And if we look at the same thing uh, in Classic Components on Vaadin uh, 24, uh, then we see the result that looks like this. It's the same horizontal layout. And what it's doing is it's bringing back these divs. It's bringing back the div structure. It's bringing back the primary style names of V dash horizontal layout and every single uh, class uh, that was provided by default in the bottom runtime in, uh, in, in the component in, in the DOM. This also is reproduced in uh, uh, the, the classic component uh, DOM. It goes further. You can see inside the divs. We also have the slots. We also have the spacings. We have the empty divs uh, stuck in between all of these uh, 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 components that are in the uh, container. And uh, that, that means that, yeah, there's a lot of things that you would normally have to worry about if you were moving to a Vaadin 24 around uh, the styling that you don't have to worry about because uh, the, there is this compatibility. And this is just another way of uh, well, first of all, of getting through your project quickly, that you can remove the actual dependencies on Vaadin 8, and uh, you can still gradually finish this migration and uh, do this when, uh, at, at, as you have time with your uh, developers. All right, um, this is what I wanted to show you around classic components. I'm going to pass uh, the word now to my colleague, Daniele, who will take us through automation and assessment. Thank you, Ben. Um, so as you can see in the next slide, um, I'm going to tell you about the upgrade automation and how does it work. So first of all, uh, let's assess how the migration um, is going to work inside the automation um, and which technology we decided to use. So to, to do the, the automation, there are many technologies that are uh, pretty common uh, in, in the web and uh, from other technologies that, do, that does this kind of uh, thing. Uh, one of those is, for example, find a replace on, on text. Uh, and others, for example, are um, libraries that, uh, that are able to parse Java code, change the Java code, and then write a new Java file um, based on this library description. 
So both of those technologies um, do not follow some of the concept, some philosophies that we wanted to, uh, to keep in mind while doing this uh, automation. So the first one uh, is that we, we want the, your source code um, to stay in the same um, aspect. So this means that the indentation, the structure of uh, the, or, or the original source code should stay the same. Um, the comments should be preserved and the file should not be created anew, uh, but we should apply specific differences when it's needed. So uh, it's not about creating a new Java file, it's about changing only when it's needed to minimize um, the changes and not to give you something that could be alienating uh, from your, your original source code. Uh, one other element uh, that, for example, uh, text search uh, and replaces cannot be covered um, is uh, polymorphism or extensions or other elements that need to take into account a Java uh, compilation unit. So to do that, um, we use this process. Uh, so first of all, your, um, the original source code um, is being translated into something called AST, which is named abstract syntax tree, uh, which uh, represents uh, the, um, the usage of uh, Java official um, APIs. And, and specifically, we look at body uh, framework invocation. So on that, we, uh, we have many rules that we developed um, that converts body to body and flow, uh, targeting the latest version. And then we kept um, um, a, a record over this uh, abstract syntax tree on which um, we can find out each node where it's originally located into your source code. So this means that we, when, we, when we change um, the abstract syntax tree with the, with, with the rules, we can then produce the differences that we need to apply to the source code. This is very important because it means that the, uh, your original source code is going to be the same. And for example, if you are extending a VADIN component or a VADIN class, um, and, and then you are invoking um, on your extension a specific method that is coming from VADIN, for example, that will be uh, taken into account uh, into, the, into this migration. Uh, we, we did that to maximize the, uh, the effort saved by the automation and to tackle all the possible use cases uh, that we may find. Um, so um, in, in the next slide, we, we're going to see uh, how the process gets applied um, in our service. So uh, usually this happens when the migration starts. Um, so the, the first step will be running the automation and then handling whatever is left. So the automation uh, is not is, is not going to cover uh, the entire application. So it's it's not uh, that you run the automation and then magically your application will be able to to run and be delivered. Will be still need uh, something to do uh, at the end of it. Um, so for example, theming, uh, and, and that is something that is going to be done afterwards. This is because uh, the automation is going to take a big chunk of um, work that is usually uh, repetitive and for, for, for developers and it could usually end up um, being inconsistent. So for example, if you have many developers working on the same application, uh, a specific change, even if it's repetitive or, or simple, can end up being different um, at the end of it. So you, you would end up with different uh, conversions rules that, that, that gets applied. So the, the, the suggestion is to start using that to start using the automation and then do whatever the automation didn't uh, convert it at the end of it. Um, so uh, this, this process happened uh, by um, having a VADIN expert that is able to access uh, the, the original source code. Then the VADIN expert, uh, based on the, the abstract syntax tree, is able to define um, a specific um, configuration for our rules to maximize the output. This means, for example, checking the build path, if it's um, compatible with our rules, if some rules um, should work better than others, or even if we should develop a specific rule that are, uh, that are um, specifically useful uh, to this um, source code we are analyzing. At the end of this process, um, we apply the changes to the source code, and then the, pro uh, the, the process uh, is uh, completed. And then we can start with additional changes and then 
do um, and then reach the end of, of the migration. Um, so um, to give you some examples, so uh, we first need to talk about limitation. So in, in the next slide, um, we can see what is not going to be uh, covered by the automation. So it's very important to, um, to point out that um, the automation only works on Java files. So for example, themes uh, will not be affected. Uh, Third-party add-ons, so for example, if you, went, if you went inside a directory of Adi add-ons and you found uh, a very cool add-on, uh, they will not be um, converted in the automation, but it, there are higher chances that the, that the same add-on exists um, with the same APIs uh, for Vadin 24, um, or if we, or if we don't, we can, for example, search um, for an alternative. This is something we usually do during migration assessments, uh, but I will talk about this a bit later. And one other element that is not going to be covered uh, are declaratives. This is because the, the tool is only be uh, applying changes to Java code. And for example, if you use Vadin a designer, um, the changes will not uh, be applied to those files. So that doesn't mean that the automation is not going to be useful for you. Uh, but for example, the structure of your page, since it's defined uh, in uh, Vadin a uh, designer de declaratives, uh, will not be changed. But uh, still, for example, binding or uh, event re or event registration, for example, you click a button, something happens on the server, and that's all Vadin APIs, those will be affected by the uh, automation. So uh, keeping this in mind um, about what the tool can do and what, what are the limitations, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, quick examples. So uh, for example, in the next slide, um, we can see uh, an, a canonical use case. So in this use case, um, we have first the Vadinate code. So the Vadinate code is doing something very simple. It's uh, creating a layout that is extending a CSS layout, and then it's adding a label to it, uh, along with another uh, custom component. So um, the, um, the automation uh, is able to recognize uh, that we are extending a CSS layout. So as we can see, uh, the add component becomes add that is very straightforward into Vadin24. And then label uh, is going to be moved into classing components label. This is because label in Vadin 20, uh, 24 has a very different meaning uh, from what Vadin 8 had. So um, the automation tool is making these conversions. So for example, add component and add style names become add and add class names, but label goes to um, classic component. In this way, your code will be um, working with Vadin 24 and you can get rid of the rest of Vadin 8. So we have another example afterwards um, in, in the next slide. Uh, and this example is um, shows you this concept about about one-to-one -one transformation. So in, in this example, we have a grid, uh, we populate the grid, and then we want to add a renderer uh, to one of the, uh, the, the columns. So uh, as we can see, get footer, get footer row, it changes uh, into Vadin24 with get footer rows and get three. This is a very straightforward change and is on the same line. So um, the, the automation tool is able to see that only one line will be changed. So your uh, source code will not uh, be completely transformed in a way that it won't be recognizable anymore. So it's able to just replace it. Uh, into something that works with Vadin24. But for example, uh, for the set renderer, uh, it, it, it understands that we will need more than one line of code uh, for the conversion. So keeping this philosophy of one-to-one -one transformation, uh, this, uh, this algorithm to set the renderer gets moved into a, a utils class and then the method gets uh, packed in a way that the original source code only have the same line number corresponding uh, first and after the, the, the automation. So those are two simple examples uh, of a real use of a real, um, that something that could be real. Um, obviously, uh, not 100% of Vadin 8 APIs cannot be covered. There are uh, some APIs that still will need to be handled manually afterwards. Um, so if we go to the next slide, uh, we can see uh, that um, um, 
we should discuss well about how much effort uh, will be saved. So it actually depends. Um, so from real customer that we interacted with, uh, it actually goes from 50% to some customer going over 90%. Uh, this, these efforts uh, means that uh, we are going to be able to convert likely 90% of all your Java invocation over Vadin 8 towards uh, your target, which could be Vadin 23 or Vadin 24. Um, so this is very important uh, because uh, the, this value uh, is actually dependent on how many times, how many, um, how many times you use Java to interact with Vadin. So the, the the important element is: Are you relying on Java classes enough? So, for example, if you use a lot of declaratives, uh, you do a lot of theming, uh, and you use many times elements that are not uh, Vadin direct APIs. For example, you use uh, some add-ons or something or, or something like that. This is gonna influence the time needed for your um, migration. So, the, the, if, if you remember the the previous timeline, there are additional changes after the, after the, after the migration. And uh, the best use case scenario when you minimize the time that you have to work afterwards is when you rely 100% of Java. So, if your application uses a lot of Java to do everything, is is the best case when you can reach a very very high uh, effort saved. So how to know for sure, how to get the real value uh, of uh, effort saved. So uh, we have a service um, that is a very broader uh, service that we offer called migration assessment. So migration assessment is a service that we offer to customers. They want to move from any other thing that is not the latest value inversion uh, to the latest value inversion. So, for example, if you want to move from Zwing or other technologies towards the latest value inversion, we do migration assessment. Specifically, migration assessment can be done for Vadin 8 application too, if you want to upgrade to the latest Vadin version. Uh, in that specific case, when you are doing a migration assessment for a Vadin 8 application, uh, we can uh, give you uh, real estimates uh, of uh, the effort that will be saved during uh, during the automation because we can look at your code. So the, the key is that we should look at your code to know. Um, we are going to show you some examples. Uh, for example, we are going to take uh, one one customer, uh, one recent customer that is uh, that, that gave us a real um, real application that is real uh, really working with real users, and we checked uh, how the application automation um, gains will be. So, for example, if you go to the next slide, um, we can see uh, that uh, for um, all, all of our rules that are targeting around 400 um, Vadin uh, 8 classes, uh, we can see that we had 90% coverage uh, for, for this specific use case. So, uh, in this case, we can see uh, that we, first of all, um, try to fetch everything that Java used against Vadin 8. So cast expressions, method invocation, qualified name, and so on. And uh, based on those, we we were able to understand if we had a rule for it. So if we are ready, we were able to, uh, if you have the rule ready uh, to target those specific elements uh, in the source code. And the result was uh, quite uh, promising because it's, it's 90%. Uh, so this means that Java files will, would go towards Vadin 23 or Vadin 24 very quickly, and only 10% then will be needed to be done manually afterwards. So uh, more detailed uh, information is in the next slide. Uh, when we have, for example, the top 15 classes uh, that we found. So for example, uh, in, in this specific application, uh, we had um, the first one, well, was abstract component, which was uh, something expected because uh, many methods come from abstract components. So the, the the row that you can see there, uh, name so the column that you can see there, name total, uh, actually contains how many method invocation has been done in the application inside that specific class. So abstract component is there because if, you, for example, using horizontal layout is going to target abstract component if if the method is inside abstract component, and, and the coverage is how many of those methods we have a rule. Uh, uh, ready to apply conversion to. 
So as you can see, the, the lowest one was great, uh, which is uh, still high at 79% of coverage. And this is just an example to, to give you an idea of what you could expect um, doing a migration assessment on this specific area about the V8 upgrade automation. And this is um, the end of my overview. Um, thank you very much. Um. All right. Okay, so we do have a number of questions. Some of them were asked pretty early on, so I think they were addressed, but um, we will start heading through them. Uh, the first question is, are classic components licensed under Apache 2? Um, I, I guess I, I should uh, answer that. They are, uh, th they're covered by a commercial license. Uh, so uh, there's a, um, yeah, the, the, there's a commercial license uh, for that. So you would need to be a prime uh, a customer in order to uh, access them as a developer, uh, but it's based on on developers. Uh, but once you've used that, then um, uh, yeah, and and you've created your your own application, then you're you're free to distribute that as as much as you wish. Okay. I'm not an expert myself on Apache two, so I'm not sure if I completely answered that question. All righty. Okay. Um, did I see that these classic components support V7 as well? The classic component package names mention V8 uh, explicitly? Uh, there, there are. So um, there are, well, uh, most of the uh, components in classic components are actually very similar uh, in, uh, well, between Vaden 7 and Vaden 8. Um, the biggest difference between Vaden 7 and Vaden 8 uh, for these components tends to be the default. So the default values of a number of properties have sometimes changed. So what uh, Vaden classic components comes with is a configuration so that you can set the default uh, configuration of the classic components to either be Vaden 7 or to be uh, Vaden 8. Um, so that, that's the way that, that you would solve that. Okay. Uh, are classic components available in Baden 22? Um, they are in a way, uh, not the same classic components, but we do have a, a different version of them called the legacy component pack. There's a legacy component pack that's available, uh, that does, uh, pretty much the same thing. It doesn't have the same number of uh, components as classic components does, uh, but it does have uh, critically the horizontal layout, the vertical layout, the panel and the label at least. Uh, these are the uh, components that are used uh, very often. Um, so uh, you would need to look at the legacy component pack for that. Okay. Uh, does upgrade automation use open rewrite under the hood, like Spring Boot two to three migration? Uh, no, no, it's it's totally uh, offline. So it's just a based on um, on source interpretation. Okay. Do you require access to our proprietary code, or can we run the migration tool internally? and independently from Vaden employees or experts? So at the moment, um, the the tool, uh, well, the, the upgrade automation is a service. So we need to, to be able to receive uh, the source code and we should be able to compile it. And, and one of our experts run the automation and gives you back the tool um, and gives you back your source code converted. So at the moment, it's not something that the customer can run uh, on, on themselves. Okay. Do I have the choice to upgrade either to Vaden 23 or 24, or is it always the latest Vaden version? Uh, with upgrade automation, uh, it's possible to, to go to 23 or 24. Uh, you, you can choose uh, which one to target. So it's important to, to, um, 
to say that Vadin24 do not introduce uh, major changes into the API based on Vadin23. Uh, the biggest change that you have on Vadin24 are, um, are the requirements about the environment in which it runs. So it's Java 17, uh, Servlet 6, and so on. Those are the, the major changes on Vadin24. Yeah, and I can add for classic components, there is a uh, a 23 version available and the 24 version available. The 24 version is already available for classic components, so you can already use that today. Okay, can JDK 8 applications use this AST tool to migrate from 7 or 8 to 22? Um. Well, um, so the, the application automation works on Vadin 8 code. Um, if, you, if, you use an, if you have an application that runs on Java 8, um, it, it doesn't matter uh, in a sense that the automation changes your source code. So the automation um, transform your source code and, and then to run the application with Vadin 23 or 24, you will need to be able to upgrade your application to the new Java version. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, if I could add to something to, to that. So the automation tool is really changing Vaadin APIs and Vaadin dependencies. So it's not really changing anything to Java. So it's not helping you migrate from Java 8 to Java 11. Um, I'm not sure if that was the, the question that you were asking, uh, but this would be something that would be have to be covered with, uh, with manual work if there was any uh, you know, if anything would break in your application as a result of migrating from Java 8 to Java 11, uh, then you'd uh, ha have to fix that manually. Okay, is usage of components from classic package something that can be left in to final migrated product, or are they just fast way to get application running? Well, the, they are both. Um, so um, at, at the moment, for example, there, there is no grid layout in uh, Vod and Flow. Uh, the, there simply is no grid layout. Um, so if you wanted to include a grid layout in uh, your Vaadin application, then uh, the classic component would be a way of doing that. Um, so there really is no restriction on you know, how, how long you can use uh, these, uh, the compatibility package. Um, and, and classic components, uh, they are obviously they behave very differently from uh, flow components. Um, but there's nothing saying that uh, this is a, a, a wrong way of uh, behaving if that's what you like. Um, so go ahead and, and feel free to to use them. Okay, there was a follow up to that. Do they add some overhead? And if so, what is expected performance effect? The only situation where I've heard feedback from uh, the community that there was uh, some uh, performance uh, decrease that was uh, with very large grid layouts, uh, but otherwise I've not uh, heard any um, you know, comments that uh, performance was some kind of a bottleneck or, or that performance was problematic uh, for using classic components. Um, it's not really... Um, an overhead in the sense that uh, this is a an emulation or something like that. This is simply an implementation that sits on top of the very thin layer in Vaadin 24 or, or in Vaadin Flow that is the component layer, and that is in itself uh, quite thin. There's, there's uh, as we were looking at the uh, inheritance hierarchy, there's there's just components, so we're just sitting on this thin component layer. And everything else is uh, an implementation that's been copied or modified from Avada 8. So uh, not a, an overhead in the sense that um, it's being emulated or it's being uh, or that it's a horizontal layout that is having a, a different horizontal layout changing the, the behavior of that. It's, uh, it's, it's just the horizontal layout sitting on top of uh, a component just with a different implementation. Okay, is it possible to extend the upgrade automation with custom transformation rules? All right, this is a very interesting question. Um, so yes, so we um, we could develop new rules. 
um, and we can do that, uh, for example, for specific customers that have specific needs. Um, so the, the rules are developed by Vadin, so it's not like, uh, an, so there is no like an SDK that you can download and make your own rules. Uh, they are usually um, done along with the uh, the service itself. So if someone gets the the automation and then have specific needs, we can develop specific rules that we can see are gonna um, give a lot of um, gains for for the specific customer. Um, so this is definitely something we can do. Um, for example, if there is a customer that says, "Well, um, I really want this. Um, I really want to maximize um, the uh, get the effort uh, that we are going to save during the automation." And for example, we have like uh, months um, ahead of time um, to to know that you are going to need to run the tool. We can, for example, uh, prepare ourselves and, and develop specific rules that can maybe bring this customer from 80% to 90% uh, before actually doing the final conversion. All right. Is there a limit to the number of UI sessions that can be supported at the same time in 23? I believe the limit is, is, your, uh, is your RAM. So if, you're, if, if your application uses well if your application do not keep references on, on ui so you're you're following all the best practice so assuming that all the best practices are followed and when a user disconnects the ui gets uh, removed um the limitation is just how much ram can you can you keep um, inside your application um, this question is not actually related to the automation i think is is a more volume related question um, but surely there is there is no no, no specific number. Yeah, the, there's no circuit breaker in Vaden Flow that says okay if the Mac, if the number of uh, users is more than one thousand then we uh, uh, stop or something like that or we give an error. Uh, there's there's nothing built into that. Yeah, and and to uh, extend from Daniela's answer, a lot depends on on the infrastructure. So yeah, because yeah, this is going to be running on. Um, spring or a server container or something. Okay, when migrating to Vaden 23, do we have to respect other data limits for grids to keep UI well responding? I I don't have the answer at the moment. Um, this kind of, I, I don't know. I should yeah, get I, into it. Yeah, I, I've heard um, from uh, the community and also from, from uh, internal uh, chat of our uh, R&D groups that um, performance of the grid has been something that uh, we've had some uh, feedback about. And uh, this is actually something that uh, has been earmarked for a project uh, to improve the performance of the grid. Um, but uh, yeah, grid is a, is a difficult um, a component, as I've understood, because there's ways to uh, actually make it extremely performant, uh, and and you can actually get a lot of data in in grids if uh, you're you're doing it right. Um, but uh, if you do it in certain ways, then it can become very slow. Uh, but there's a number of blog posts on our website explaining about uh, things to to take into account. I'm not sure if I answered directly your your question, but these are sort of the thoughts that I have uh, when when I heard the the question. All right, what are the recommendations for self-developed GWT components when migrating from Vaden eight to Vaden twenty three? All right. Um, so if you developed um, a good component on on yourself, um, then there is no uh, GWT in in Vadin flow. So either you use MPR and then you keep your component, uh, making it coexist with your application, um, and that will work. But uh, that will be a temporary solution. Um, the only solution I, I can suggest is is to rewrite uh, the custom component uh, in a new. That's that's gonna be, um, I think, the the best solution uh, instead of uh, finding a temporary one. Yeah. 
and, and we can say from the classic component and also from the uh, the upgrade automation, uh, there is there's no solution for GWT. So we we don't have a GWT, uh, you know, module within a classic components, and we also don't uh, have GWT built into any of the rules. Um, yeah. And, and things to consider would be uh, one of the templating libraries that uh, we have. So uh, lead uh, templates or, or writing, uh, you know, th using the, the web components uh, standard, or uh, you can use Hilla. Uh, so something that I, I actually didn't mention is that Hilla and uh, Vod and Flow, that they can coexist. You can run Hilla and Flow at the same time. Uh, so if doing a lot of client side logic is uh, what you're interested in, um, then uh, TypeScript uh, might be a, um, a a good alternative for you. Okay, we've had a few questions about uh, 14. Will this migration tool also work when upgrading from Vaden 14 to 23? Yeah, that, that would be no. Um, I mean, it doesn't, okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly the challenge or what unique challenge that you're facing in going from Vaden 14 to Vaden 23, uh, but certainly no Vaden 14 to 23 uh, transformation rules have been coded today. Um, if you have a, a really big project and there's a lot of uh, simple transformations that you can see, um, yeah, we, we can consider making a, a dedicated rule set for you and uh, looking at uh, transforming those specifically or automating those transformations specifically. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the effort to upgrade from Vaden 8 uh, to Flow is, is much higher than uh, going from Vaden 14 to Vaden 23. Uh, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect much uh, to, to be gained there. But uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure what your, your challenge is. OK, do you plan to provide a set of refactoring rules like for NetBeans refactoring rules to provide automatic refactoring? Um, so it, it sounds like the question is, uh, could we, and, and it seems like there, there might be two questions along the same line uh, that we've had from uh, the, the listeners. Uh, that we could provide something that uh, you could actually run yourselves uh, and uh, that that wouldn't involve uh, Vaden uh, consultants or experts uh, actually being involved in your process uh, at all. Um, and this is something that we're talking about, um, but it's definitely not something that's available or uh, supported now. Uh, but we certainly are thinking about that, and um, that's uh, something we're uh, discussing about uh, a possible well, it's a possibility in the future. Okay, we are about to time. I will get to a couple more questions. Does the upgrade automation introduce front end tests to see if the application is still running after migration? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, so uh, it, it's it's kind of well after. So first of all, um, let's let's say that after the upgrade automation. Uh, your the code will not 100% be ready to to run so they will need uh, additional um, things to do so if you have for example 90% uh, of conversion then you will be left with a source code with still 10% of uh, work to be done so um, it's very important to say that the upgrade automation will not give you a working application that can be directly tested uh, right away um, and I, I think an, a, another question is, that will the test be converted? So if you already have a test, will the test be converted? And the answer is no. Uh, even if uh, we are considering that uh, pos uh, this possibility in the future, uh, at the moment, the, we are only targeting the runnable bad code. Okay, if I would have a V8 app running with Java 8 and I would like to upgrade to V24, do you recommend to do the Java 8 to Java 17 upgrade work before migrating to V24 or just the opposite? Well, um, I think the opposite will be impossible uh, because you will not be able to run your application if you go to 24 before move, moving to Java 17. 
So I think it's, it's not, so I think it's the only way to first um, make the application run with Java 17. Or I think the best way is to say together at this point. Yeah. I also think that's a hand in hand uh, transformation that you have to do both. Okay, great. A lot of good questions. Um, if we didn't address one of your questions, feel free to reach out. You can go to button.com and there's a contact us button. Uh, feel free to reach out. We're happy to help. Um, I wanted to, again, thank you, Ben and Daniela for presenting today. And thank you to everyone else for joining. We hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Have a nice day.